very well. I'm a punk. A cretunculous schnunk. Nobody loves me. Not one tiny hunk. I agree. I'm a griffulous, grofulous groove. I'm a schmoozler, a schminkler, and a poopoobler, too. I'm a horrendous object, which nobody loves. I'm untouchable, unless you wear antiseptical gloves. So what? I'm a punk, a cretunculous schnunk. Well, the words used plenty of ways. There were good kids and then there were punks. There was someone that you didn't like how they looked, how they acted. You'd just call them a punk. In the 50s, if you looked like Elvis, you were a punk. About the use of the word in on an 1899 newspaper article in San Francisco talking about an entertaining event and how a fellow could not really sing. It's a punk. An event where Pedro the punk poet was performing in 1916. Or in 1919, this comic strip ad about a chorus girl having to go out for an encore to sing a punk song. How about this one, where you're to compare and match singers, their names, to being either punk, lousy, or marvelous. Elvis plays punk roles in Raphael theater film ad in 1957, casted as a hot-headed punk. How about a Dick Tracy comic in 1965? I bet the band Suicide, an ad in the Village Voice in 1970. Monkeys Refocus, 1973, Hartford Current in Connecticut. Song wise, well, Zappa had Flower Punk, The Who, Brownsville Station, School Punks, and Sweet. The band, 1975 in L.A. Times. Now, John Holmstrom and Legs McNeil named their magazine Punk. Now, that's because that is what was used to describe rock and roll for many years. Caroline Kuhn, journalist for Melody Maker, pivotal person in the uh, London scene. In July 76, called Johnny Rotten the king of punk. Now the punk bands, well, they hated the term. They hated that label. So here I am presenting a uh, Frankenstein version of a punk documentary. Clearly, there are hundreds of documentaries out there. So many books on the internet, so many books, hard copies, so many facts, so many lies, and so many mistakes. As we distance ourselves from this era, the stories need to still carry on. We know there's punk today, and we know they're carrying on musically. We know generations have passed on, and offshoots and different sounds have grown, and it left me with many questions about how and why and who and where and what happened. Why did it happen? This is my version of compiling my research and bringing what I found to you. The questions I always had and questions I know speaking to people they had also and confusion. There's a lot of gaps 
like I said, there's a lot of people out there who did answer and provide this information, but I tried trying to compile this together and make it some type of understandable format for you. I don't care for the term punk myself. It's kind of awkward. I can't even use it when I go to a record show, unless I forget. I don't like to ask for, do you have any punk records? I, I usually say, do you have any of that music from the 70s, like Dolls, Iggy, Pistols, Joy Division? I was thinking and trying to come up with my own terms, you know, looking back now, a little hindsight. What could have we called punk? Punk something else. Uh, <laughs> I came up with crystal music. I, basically, when you look in crystal, it's just many reflections of many things. Um, chaos music, splinter music. I did like the, gr the word grunge. Um, I do like scrap. Basically, what I'm going to cover in this documentary, um, some groundwork of punk, hows and whys, like I mentioned. The U.S. music scene, some of the early type punks, how London, the environment, had changed and led up to their punk world and punk times in the 70s. Malcolm McLaren, his contingency plan, his fashion shops with Vivian. Very important, very key information there. I think people are missing. Sylvain Sylvain from the Dolls and, and Malcolm. The genesis of 70s punk, reggae and punk, the punk scene evolution with key clubs and events, the Bill Grundy show and the downfall of punk, some key people, the punk offshoots, I'm gonna give you some of my favorite punk albums. I'm not gonna go into the hardcore side of punk. So, punk of the modern times, feeling frustration and rage. This was turned into ideas that can be acted on, and it did, in the 70s. This behavior was n not anything new, but it was a different version. It emancipated, released a new generation. Back to rock music's original inspiration, it created their own subculture. Who and what came first as punk? Well, the rock and roll out of the 50s, but you can also go back to the 40s and Sinatra, and you can go back to the uh, turn of the century. It all bleeds into the common denominator of shocking disorder original, expressive, rebellion, and also just tired of it all. It showed up in every generation in different formats. Hey, even the hippies were punk. Starting around the 50s, in most households, if a dad had a crew cut, then the rest of the boys in the family, well, they had one also. It was a structure, a life structure, rules, it was eminent, and the rules and roles were certainly in place in this time. However, as things started to change with music and pop culture, like Jimmy Dean, Collar Up, Brando to Leather Jackets, kids, they started to want their own identity. They started taking on chores and they started getting allowances. So what did they do? They started buying their own clothes and saving up to buy records. This kicked off the rock and roll rockabilly explosion in the 50s. It became their own music. Regardless of what the preacher said and declared it being devil music, it was there and it was popular. The music made the kids 
move, belong, feel, and have some identity. It sounds familiar. One of these super icons of the early rock and roll was Jerry Lee Lewis. He delivered what he felt. He broke some barriers. Marrying a 13-year-old second cousin. That's pretty out there. When he was playing, he was really envious of his bandmates and how they were able to move around and dig the music and feel the music. He had to sit at the piano. And so they wound up telling him, why don't you just get up and, and move a bit and dance and feel it? And that's what he did. He got up in one of those shows and he started moving. He accidentally kicked over the the chair and that became one of his standout moves was kicking the chair over and then he started moving around and jamming and playing with his feet and loosening up hair flopping in front of his face he wanted to shock and be a badass he wanted to feel it all one time he he did a show in a festival and he wanted to close but Chuck Berry was in was a uh, part of the acts and he was the closer so he said no way you're not gonna close so Jerry said uh, all right go ahead so during his break uh, before he was going on he went outside to a hardware store he got some lighter fluid at the end of his act, he set his piano on fire. And he walked off, smirked and smiled at Chuck, and he said, follow that. Now, he admitted after he shouldn't have done that. He said, Chuck is the tops. He regretted it after, but at the moment, he felt he needed to do it. In the late 50s, a Shawnee American Indian, Link Ray, born in North Carolina. He took a lot of abuse. He had a lot of anger. Link's trademark was his distorted volume. He wanted different sounds than everyone else. And he punched holes in his amp speakers. The great song that we, most of us know, Rumble. Now was banned from the radio to fear that it would provoke public disturbance funny and ironic thing was it was an instrumental As the early 60s developed, the Brill Building, the girl groups, the teen idols, the surf, the American bandstand, the, the mainstream was popular. There were groups that became garage and punk oriented. Ones that wanted different sounds, the Kingsmen, the Trashmen, the Monks, the Sonics, the Trogs, the 13 Floor Elevators, the Standells, them. Question Mark and the Mysterians, the Kinks, the Ho, Easy Beats, even the Stones, the Beatles, and Small Faces, Yardbirds. I mean, listen to the Stones, Get Off My Cloud, 19th Nervous Breakdown, Paint It Black, Mother's Little Helper. Those are pretty robust different songs for that time frame even in 64 a band from Peru called Los Sacos they were amateurs four of them they lived near each other they got together you know listen to surf music and they got to play on a radio local radio station and the station got so many calls that this band just took off 1964. It was more about their sound 
and they developed a cult following. They were considered punks. In 1967, there was a music revolution, yep, that was going on. Groundwork done in 66, and Beatles, and Stones, and then you also got the West Coast in the U.S. They were jumping off on their own world. LSD had a major influence. Love was huge, the band. They were an R&B band and basically uh, got a facelift and went their own direction. The Doors were fans of love. Break On Through was pivotal and Morrison took his level. That combination of mu music and lyrics and his delivery. Not a great voice, but he knew how and what to do to make it powerful. Listen to the end. How about the journey that it takes you through? Morrison's attitude was punk. In Detroit, 1968, the Doors were playing at a formal college dance. It was advertised. Excitement was in the air. Hey, the Doors are coming. Break on through. Well, they expected a nice, pleasant Doors, but... Morrison showed up, he was tripping. He gave it to the audience. Not a formal dance whatsoever. A young fellow there named Jimmy Osterberg was in the audience, he was blown away. He said, that's what I want to do and I can do it. He went on to be Iggy and the Stooges. They were a taste of what to was to come about. They were against the grain. It cannot get more raw than Iggy and the Stooges. The MC5 was Iggy's big brother band. They're known as punk also, and that's because they're extremely loud in political statements, taking on and fighting the system. It's pretty punk, and their music was great. It was so much turmoil going on at that time. There's not much to add and to tell you about how fantastic and what Iggy and the Stooges contributed and helped to define this genre. They made the groove and people wanted to emulate it. The Velvet Underground was doing it their way also and bringing the beat generation literally in a literary sense to music. Who was singing about heroin directly? Not politically, but as an FU to the industry. It's my music, it's my attitude. You don't like it, too bad. That was Lou. How cool was that? I want to start talking about the UK and London and the period and go back a little bit in the history some of you know some of you don't know well the post-war gloom in the 50s in England had emerging groups called the Teddy Boys or the Teds an original teen subculture that was the foundation for the later mods and rockers punks New Romantics, etc. But let's go back to what and when England had the Edwardian period, 1901, 1910, and beyond. King Edward VII, son of Queen Victoria. So we know about the Victorian period, Queen Victoria, and the conservative side of things. The death of Queen Victoria ended the Victorian period in 1901. There was major changes in England in politics and other social classes. Things started get, getting a, recognized more, involved. Women began to take part in politics. It was a more liberal movement. Dressing up in nice clothing was important. Fashion was a big statement. The Edwardian look, Teddy Boy look, the Teddy Boy style that swept through Britain in the 50s brought back the Edwardian style. 
and it had a newer twist. Teddy Boys was the nicknames given to this style. Clothing, getting dressed up became a means of escape for the underclass. The young blue collar working young men gravitated quickly to this. With the fashion in place, so came the 50s music. Mostly from the US. Bill Haley, Rockin' Around the Clock. As the rock and roll movies came out, so did the behavior. They were told to behave themselves, but the teens rioted and destroyed theaters. They started banning the movies. Point here is fashion and rock and roll. What's it mean? Blank Rebels Motorcycle Club. <laughs> Isn't that cute? <laughs> hey, Johnny, what are you rebelling against? What do you got? Then comes Marlon Brando and the Wild One, motorcycles and jeans and leather jackets. And then the 60s rockers and early 60s are formed. Gene Vincent, Eddie Conkred, rockers' names, not from the music, but from four cycle engine. The word rocker. Also the mod, a modern. That's an offshoot of a teddy boy. Approximately around 1964, the mods came about. Wanting to stand out of the crowd, they turned their back on the British class tradition and they looked for inspiration from the US and especially Europe. Design and fashion was huge. Italian and French fashion. Getting dressed up was big. And it merged into the mod. They started dressing up in lightweight designs, Italian fashions, new cut of clothes, a look of freedom and rebellion. Now, the mods and rockers around 1964, they both were different perspectives, different likes, different dislikes, especially with style and music. But with that, the one thing they had in common was a camaraderie a family atmosphere, a feeling, a belonging. There was one particular bank holiday weekend. They both took rides to coastal towns in 64. There was one meetup between the Rockers and the Mods in Clacton. It was an extremely cold and dreary weekend. Kids got re restless. They were bored, not much to do. And there were some minor scuffles between the two groups. Some police got involved, but it was a non-event, a few arrests, but very little damage. Now, the outside maiden news press, back in London, they got wind of this. They were sort of bored, and they figured, hey, let's jump on this. So they were the ones that built this up for national news and magnified this event and developed a more vibrant and action story between the gangs. The press were the ones to try to incite riots between the two groups. Did you start the punk movement, you think? As I just wasn't even there, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were there for satisfaction. Yeah, I don't know. I, I really can't talk about that very much because I wasn't in England in that period. I don't really know. I only know the flat that we've gotten over here. Uh, some things I liked about it, some I didn't. You know, I, I think that a lot of it was what they were trying to do was to sound like what they owe when they were kids, you know, which was our rough old records, you know. They, and they dug that, you know, so that's all right. I just don't think they had enough time to get their music together, you know. It was more like a theatre, the punk thing, than an actress, you know, rock and roll show, you know. Now, in another event, Hastings and Brighton, hordes of members of each side now gathered again in another time, and this led to a clash of riots, exactly what the press wanted to control and have something to write about. The point here, well, came how territorial these gangs were, how malicious the, the, uh, the press was, and their involvement in transforming the youth lifestyle. 
and making a rivalry into some bad blood. However, this exploded the mod's popularity. So many young kids saw and they also heard their parents fuming over these riots. They started wanting to rebel. They wanted to, to get piece of this action. They sort of like it, thought it was cool. This popularity, however, put off the original mods. All of a sudden, an increase of mods and joining and dressing became a style and a fashion that just increased. The core, the foundation, w was lost. The mods didn't feel special anymore. Nothing was unique. Everything started looking the same, the people dressing the same, and more music started developing, which was good, but it just lost that core. So hence, this is why it said punk was so short-lived and died a quick death in 1975 to 77, that one and a half years. The real punks were exploited then and became mass produced. Steve Jones had said it was the beginning of the end the day after the Bill Grundy show. I was doing this hop at this record hop in, uh, uh, in Fredericksburg, Virginia, 1957. And uh, like five, about 5,000 kids out there, you know, because I mean, rock and roll at that time was huge. Yeah. Everywhere you went, I mean, the kids were just like a storm, you know. And I'm just up there playing, you know, the old hits, you know, you know, uh, 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 Chuck Berry, you know, you know, play, you know, just, just, just stuff, you know, nothing really, you know, and uh, and the Diamonds had came, they were like number one, they had the number one hit. Mm -hmm. They came to this year Milk Grant show, you know, and so I was doing the hop for this Milk Grant, the disc jockey, TV disc jockey. Mm -hmm. And so he, he brought the diamonds out to the, to the, to the, to the hop. And I was supposed to get off the stage. And they would pant, they would put a, a record on him. They would pantomime to the kids, you know. Right. So, that's the way they did back in those days. Yeah. So instead of milk doing that, he just jumped on the stage, Link, play me a stroll. I said, I don't know a stroll. Doug said, I know the beat behind one. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, so I said, okay. And I went, like this, and then my God, man. Watching me, you know, he said, bam, I went. You know, yeah. and my brother Ray, he grabs the microphone, right? Because the only mic they had back in those days was just for the singers. They didn't mic the amps or anything. So he just took the mic, stick it down here like this, right? Mm -hmm. So I just took my amplifier and turned it wide open. And, and I had an old premier amplifier, right? So I just turned the tremolo on, and I was playing. You couldn't even hear Shorty, and Doug was playing so loud because he was playing with the butt ends of his stick. So all you could really hear was just me and Doug. You know, I was doing. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, and the kids they just went ape. You know, and went screaming over me, and Doug got so. He got so, you know, because we've been there all night long, and the kids didn't pay a bit of attention to us <laughs> all night long. And so when I started doing this song, they started screaming over me, you know, because I'm now now there's something happening, right? Uh -huh. So Doug, he got so he got so uh, carried away, he jumped just up off the drums. I said, Doug, let's finish the song anyhow. So he gets back on the, on the drums, and we play. We had to play about four times for the kids. They kept hollering, and screaming, you know, banging on the stage. You know, play that weird. Song.
Ever get the feeling you've been cheated? Good night. <laughs> <laughs>